April 3, 1941, RAF Mildenhall, Suffolk. The Wellington bomber sat on the dispersal hard standing, its fabric-covered frame gleaming dully under the pale moonlight. Squadron leader James Ward and his five-man crew moved through their pre-flight checks with mechanical precision. They had done this 23 times before, load up with incendiaries and high explosives, cross the North Sea, find the target, drop the bombs, come home. Tonight's destination was Bremen, one of Germany's vital industrial ports. Intelligence suggested the flak defenses had been thinned for operations elsewhere. Before we continue, if you're fascinated by stories of incredible survival and engineering brilliance from World War II, hit that like button and subscribe to stay updated with more untold stories from the greatest conflict in history. Let us know in the comments where you're watching from. We love hearing from our global community of history enthusiasts. What nobody mentioned during the briefing was the ongoing argument raging through RAF Bomber Command about the very aircraft they were climbing into. The Vickers Wellington had become the backbone of Britain's night bombing offensive, yet it remained controversial among pilots who had flown more conventional designs. The source of controversy wasn't the engines or defensive armament, it was the fabric. While American and German bombers boasted all metal stressed skin construction, the Wellington was wrapped in Irish linen stretched over a peculiar basket-weave metal framework. It looked more like something supporting a greenhouse than defending against cannon fire. Barnes Wallace, the engineer behind this unorthodox design, had endured years of skepticism from Air Ministry officials. He had explained it countless times. The interlocking lattice of light alloy members formed a structure where loads distributed themselves automatically across multiple paths. On paper, it worked brilliantly. In practice, every pilot who looked at those fabric panels rippling in the wind wondered whether they were climbing into a death trap. Ward wasn't among the doubters. He had felt the Wellington absorb punishment over Wilhelmshaven when a flak burst tore a hole through the port wing large enough to crawl through. The bomber had flown home steady as a train on rails. The engines coughed to life at 2100 hours. Within minutes, Ward had the Wellington rolling down the runway, climbing into the darkness. Navigation lights blinked off as they crossed the coast. From here to Target and back, they were alone in a sky that belonged equally to them and to German night fighters prowling for prey. And in that moment, Ward had no idea that tonight would prove Wallace's theories in ways no laboratory test ever could, or that his aircraft would become living proof that sometimes the most sophisticated engineering looks deceptively simple. The geodetic principle wasn't new. Wallace had borrowed it from bridge engineering and airship design. During his work on the R-100 airship between 1929 and 1930, he discovered something revolutionary. That enormous dirigible taught Wallace that conventional methods weren't always optimal. The R-100's framework used intersecting spirals forming triangulated structures that distributed loads across the entire frame. When the airship pitched in turbulent air, no single member bore excessive force because dozens shared every load simultaneously. Translating that to a combat aircraft required unprecedented innovation. Traditional aircraft used longer ons, long members running nose to tail with formers attached perpendicular. This created obvious weak points. Severe battle damage to a single longer on could cause catastrophic failure. Wallace proposed something radical. Eliminate longer ons entirely creating a basket weave where every member intersected with every other, forming thousands of interlocked triangles. The Wellington's geodetic fuselage consisted of 1,932 individual light alloy members, each machined to exacting tolerances. Every member connected to at least six adjacent members, creating redundancy where failure of any single component reduced overall strength by less than 0.1%. What made this revolutionary was its behavior under asymmetric loading, exactly what battle damage creates. When a shell severed members on one side, the loads redistributed through the entire three-dimensional network to undamaged members on the opposite side. The structure automatically found alternative load paths. It was passive damage tolerance built into the fundamental architecture. The first indication something had gone wrong came at 2245 hours still 30 miles from Bremen. Skipper, we've got company. Looks like a 110 7 o'clock high. A Messerschmitt BF 110 night fighter equipped with Liechtenstein radar. 
Ward pushed into a shallow dive, attempting to gain speed. But the twin engine fighter had every advantage. The Messerschmitt opened fire at 600 yards, four 7.92 meter machine guns and two 20 millimeter cannons. The cannon shells were designed to destroy bomber structures. They didn't just puncture, they exploded on impact. The machine gun rounds fired at over 1,000 rounds per minute, creating a stream of metal that could slice through anything. The first burst walked across the Wellington's fuselage from tail to midship. The fabric offered no resistance. Rounds punched through both sides like tissue paper. The sound, like someone rapidly striking a snare drum mixed with fireworks, filled the interior. Ward felt the aircraft shudder from the kinetic energy. The navigator looked up to see starlight streaming through holes that hadn't existed seconds earlier. But the German pilot had made a critical error, firing too early. Ward threw the Wellington into evasive maneuvers, hauling back on the controls and bleeding speed to force the Messerschmitt to overshoot. The German flashed past and had to break away. That respite lasted 40 seconds. Then came the second fighter from higher altitude. This pilot was more patient, closing to 300 yards before opening fire. The concentration was devastating. Cannon shells exploded against the geodetic framework, sending fragments spinning through the interior. One detonated against a main spar, creating percussion that rang through the entire airframe. Machine gun rounds stitched patterns across both wings. Then Bremen's flak opened up. The 88 meter guns burst in preset patterns designed to box in bombers. Each explosion sent thousands of steel fragments outward at lethal velocity. The Wellington flew through three separate bursts. The aircraft bucked and yawed with each near-miss concussion waves hitting the fabric like invisible fists. Ward's instruments told a story of systematic destruction. The airspeed indicator danced erratically. Oil pressure dropped, then stabilized. The compass spun uselessly. Yet beneath the chaos, Ward could feel something defying expectation. The Wellington was still flying normally. The controls responded precisely. There was no alarming vibration, no tendency to yaw, no sensation of coming apart. The wireless operator found himself watching machine gun rounds enter one side and exit the other, passing through empty space between structural members without hitting anything vital. He could count 17 holes within arm's reach, each surrounded by torn fabric flapping in the slipstream. Yet the aircraft maintained altitude and heading as though nothing had happened. The first Messerschmitt pilot repositioned for another attack. He fired another burst, roughly 120 rounds combined. He watched tracers impact the fuselage and wings, saw fabric tear away in strips, observed pieces breaking free. In his combat report filed three hours later, he would confidently claim a Wellington destroyed. No aircraft could absorb that damage and survive. He broke away certain he had witnessed a death spiral begin. But the Wellington hadn't entered any spiral. This wasn't luck. This was geodetic construction doing exactly what Wallace promised. Each time a round severed a framework member, the load redistributed to adjacent members. The structure healed around damage like a spider's web. Break one strand and the web sags but doesn't collapse because 50 others share the burden. The second Messerschmitt pilot recognized something unusual. He had destroyed 11 bombers and they all followed predictable patterns once damaged. They lost altitude. They trailed smoke. They developed pronounced yaws. This Wellington was doing none of those things, simply continuing toward Bremen as though annoyed rather than mortally wounded. His third pass added another 47 holes, three passing within inches of Ward's head. One cannon shell exploded against the main spar behind the pilot's seat. Ward checked the controls still responsive, airframe still solid. The German pilot, now critically low on ammunition and fuel, broke off and headed home, filing probable destroyed rather than confirmed kill. He couldn't understand what he had witnessed, couldn't comprehend that fabric and basket weave could outperform solid metal. What the German didn't know was that Luftwaffe intelligence had fundamentally misunderstood Wellington construction. A November 1939 report characterized the geodetic approach as antiquated, suitable for civilian transport rather than combat. The analysis concluded that fabric covering provided virtually no protection, and British reliance indicated industrial limitations rather than informed design. This reflected Germany's own philosophy. 
The Luftwaffe had committed to all metal construction. The Junkers 88, Heinkel 111, and Dornier 17 all featured aluminum structures where the skin carried primary loads. German engineers assumed British fabric-covered bombers would tear extensively from each impact, rapidly compromising structure. Night fighter doctrine emphasized short bursts aimed at the fuselage. Why waste ammunition when fabric construction meant targets would disintegrate after a few dozen rounds? Pilots were taught to engage, fire briefly, then seek new targets. Visual confirmation was unnecessary. If you hit a Wellington properly, it ceased flying. But Wellingtons kept flying home with damage that should have been lethal. Ward brought the Wellington back across the North Sea at reduced speed. The shredded fabric changed aerodynamics slightly. Minor drag increase and occasional buffeting. They had completed their bomb run despite the attacks. The navigator plotted their course using celestial navigation after the compass failed. The Suffolk coast materialized ahead. Ward set the Wellington down at 0230 hours on April 6th, with the same gentle touchdown as his previous operations. As the bomber rolled to a stop, ground crew cycling toward them had no indication of anything unusual. The engines shut down, and Ward's crew climbed out stretching cramped muscles. Then Flight Sergeant Thomas Hicks brought his torch across the fuselage and stopped walking. The beam revealed systematic destruction, a fuselage like a colander. He moved the torch methodically, illuminating hole after hole, each punched cleanly through both sides. Where cannon shells had exploded against framework, damage was more severe. Twisted metal, torn fabric hanging in strips, internal components visible through gaps that shouldn't exist. Hicks initiated standard battle damage assessment. Every hole was marked with chalk, numbered, and logged. As the count climbed past 50, then 100, then 150, the ground crew simply stared. They had never seen anything survive this destruction. The final count came to 203 separate penetrations. 87 machine gun rounds had passed completely through without hitting structure. 41 struck framework members directly, severing 11 completely. 19 cannon shells created larger damage zones. The remaining 56 were flak fragments. What astonished them wasn't just quantity but distribution. Control cables had escaped unscathed, despite being surrounded by holes. Fuel tanks were punctured, but self-sealing bladders prevented catastrophic loss. Electrical systems were partially compromised, but backups maintained operation. Hydraulic lines were severed, but turrets remained mechanically sound. Hicks walked around twice trying to reconcile what he saw with engineering understanding. By every assessment, this aircraft should have broken apart over Germany. Yet here it sat, geometry intact, framework solid, fundamentally airworthy, despite looking like it had flown through a hailstorm of steel. Hicks made a decision that would have seemed reckless. Rather than Category 3 damage requiring weeks of depot repair, he classified it Category 2, repairable at station level within 48 hours. Despite spectacular damage, no primary structural failure occurred. The geodetic framework retained sufficient integrity. More importantly, Bomber Command needed every available aircraft. The repair crew numbered 14 men. They had 40 hours. Where members were severed, the solution was straightforward. Cut away damage, splice and replacement pieces using fish plate reinforcements, stress test the repair. This demonstrated geodetic advantages. In traditional structures, replacing damaged members required disassembling large sections. Geodetic members were individually accessible. A fitter could reach any member, cut it away, and install replacement within 20 minutes. By 0500 hours, structural repairs were complete. 11 members replaced, 32 reinforced, framework stress tested with sandbags. Measurements matched undamaged values. Fabric patches covered 197 holes. Six non-critical holes were left unpatched. At 2,000 hours on April 6th, barely 17 hours after Ward landed, pilot officer Robert Chen completed pre-flight checks on the same aircraft for that night's operation against Kiel. Nobody mentioned repairs were completed three hours earlier, or that the aircraft had absorbed 203 strikes less than a day ago. Chen noticed fresh patches immediately, dozens scattered across fuselage and wings. A few unpatched holes remained, fabric edges fluttering. He walked around slowly, then looked at Hicks. 
She took punishment last night. We've checked every member, replaced what needed replacing. She's as airworthy as any Wellington on this station. Chen understood geodetic design enough to appreciate what it meant. The patches reassured him. They proved the aircraft had survived and returned intact. R. Robert was now the most thoroughly inspected Wellington at Milden Hall. Robert lifted off at 2037 hours. The wireless operator tested equipment, everything functional. The rear gunner traversed his turret, full freedom of movement. Every system operated as designed. The ability to repair severe battle damage at station level within hours represented enormous operational advantage. By mid-1941, Bomber Command's analysis compared Wellington loss rates to other types under equivalent conditions. Wellington's encountering fighters returned 63% of the time, compared to 41% for Whitley's and 37% for Hampton's. With extensive battle damage, Wellington survived at nearly twice the rate. This was statistical validation of geodetic superiority. German intelligence eventually recognized their misassessment. Late 1941 bulletins revised guidance, acknowledging British geodetic construction required modified doctrine. But this came too late to prevent hundreds of Wellingtons from limping home with damage doctrine insisted should be lethal. The Wellington's combat record influenced post-war bomber design in ways that weren't immediately obvious. No major post-war bomber adopted geodetic construction directly. The method was too labor-intensive for mass production and offered diminishing advantages as jet engines eliminated the weight efficiency requirements that had made it attractive for piston-engined aircraft. But the principle of distributed load paths and redundant structure became fundamental to military aviation design philosophy. Modern aircraft incorporate multiple redundant systems specifically because the Wellington proved that survivability depended on ensuring that damage to any single component couldn't cause catastrophic failure. 11,461. Wellington served with Bomber Command during the war. Statistical analysis suggests geodetic construction prevented approximately 2,300 additional losses compared to conventional bombers. Roughly 13,800 aircrew who came home because their aircraft refused to break apart when physics and German engineering insisted they should. That Wellington sitting at Mildenhall on April 6th, covered in patches and ready for another mission, represented more than one aircraft's survival. It represented vindication of a design philosophy that prioritized resilience over rigidity, distributed strength over concentrated robustness. It proved that sometimes the most sophisticated solution looks deceptively simple, like a woven basket wrapped in Irish linen, holding together against impossible odds through pure mathematical elegance. The fabric may have torn, but the framework beneath remained unbroken.